refers to a broad research area in which we use the strain engineering in order to fabricate new functional devices. Basically, that is, that is the whole, let's say, idea of strain tronics. So in the same way as in an electrical device like a elect, uh, field effect transistor, you use uh, the gate voltage that you apply to the transistor as a tuning knob in order to adjust the output characteristics of your device. The idea in strain tronics is to use mechanical deformations applied at will to your device in order to modulate, to tune the output of your, of your device. And in particular, in my, in my research group, we are interested on optoelectronics. So the idea that we have of our strain tronic devices is a device like, like this cartoon here, in where we apply a mechanical deformation and we, we manage to get uh, a modification of the output characteristics of this, of this device. In this particular case, it's a photodetector, what we aim to, in where we can tune the spectral bandwidth by applying a mechanical deformation to this, to this photodetector. This will be uh, a solid state mimic of uh, an adaptable photodetector like the one we have in the human eye. Okay, in the case of the human eye, uh, the spectral response of the human eye is shifted in, in high illumination conditions and low illumination conditions. This is what is called the scotopic and photopic uh, behavior of the human eye. So it's, a, it's an adaptable photodetector. And this is what we want to copy in a solid state device. So we want to fabricate photodetectors in where just by applying a mechanical deformation at will, we can tune the output characteristics. Okay. So strain engineering seems to be like the key of uh, strain tronics. So you, you engineer the strain, the mechanical deformation in order to fabricate a tunable device. So why two-dimensional materials are particularly good for this kind of strain tronic device or, or strain engineering applications? Up to now, strain engineering has been used in semiconductor industry and in the material science community uh, by simply growing uh, materials on top of each other, forcing epitaxial growth. And using materials with different lattice parameters, so in this case here we have three different materials in this cartoon here with three different lattice parameters. And if we force them to grow on top of each other, so let's fix this gallium arsenide as the substrate, and then we grow on top this gallium arsenide phosphide, and on top of that, we grow this indium gallium arsenide. What we get is basically a stretched film here of gallium arsenide, arsen, ars, gallium arsenide phosphide and a compressed indium gallium arsenide. Okay, so this, in this way, we can engineer the strain on this, on this particularly in this particular sample. But the problem with this approach for strain engineering is that it's not tunable. So this, this strain is static. So you cannot use this strain as a tuning knob. That is what we want for strain tronic applications. And all these crystalline three-dimensional materials, they are typically brittle. So it means that the amount of deformation you can apply for them to them is relatively small. So you cannot tune that much. And usually, this, uh, this kind of a straining approach is, is used in order to apply a uniform uh, homogeneous strain on all the wafer. So you cannot apply localized strains to the, to the, to the sample, is easily at least. Two dimensional materials, they were like the game changer in strain engineering, okay? Because basically these materials, they can be deformed easily. Like in this example here, for instance, we have a molybdenum disulfide film on top of holes, that makes like a, like a nanoscopic version of a drum head, okay? And then we can use an AFM tip in order to indent in the middle of the drum head in order to modify the deformation at will. So we can change these deformations dynamically. So we can change in time the strain. Uh, during this kind of indentation experiments in several, in several groups have been seen that these materials, they can stand very large deformations in the order of 10 to 15% which is very, very close to the fundamental limit in where the breakdown is, is motivated by the separation between the atoms and is not because of the coalescence of defects. Okay, so in an ideal solid where you have no defects, basically the breakdown force is around one ninth of the ion modulus. And this is very, very similar to the breaking forces that we see in, in two dimensional semiconducting materials. So 
these are indeed uh, quite interesting mechanical properties for, for strain toric applications, but also in these two-dimensional semiconducting materials. You can also tune the band gap of these semiconductors in a, in a very strong way applying these mechanical deformations. So now we have, in one hand, two-dimensional materials that allows you to, fabric, to, to apply strain in a variable way, so you can change the strain. And on the other hand, we have that this strain affects quite strongly to the band gap of the semiconducting material. So this is ideal for strain-tronic applications. And I believe that these are unique features of two-dimensional materials that makes them different to three-dimensional semiconductors. And that's why I truly believe that two-dimensional strain-tronic, two-dimensional materials might find a niche application in strain-tronic applications, in strain-tronic devices. So, but so far, most of the works you can find in the literature, they're, they're just dealing with fundamental studies. They don't, they don't fabricate devices. What they do is, in most of the works you can find in the literature, they apply a strain to a two-dimensional material, and they use some kind of optical probe in order to test, to probe, to sense the change in the band gap of the semiconducting material. But they don't have electrodes, they don't change the output characteristics. So there are a few early examples of strain-tronic devices in where they, they indeed contact these materials and they measured electrical properties upon mechanical deformation, uh, but, but there are a few of them. So the first one uh, I, I would like to highlight is from the group of, of Andraskis in Lausanne, and in that case they fabricated this freely suspended beam of molybdenum disulfide between two electrodes. And what they were doing, it was, it was measuring the resistance between these two electrodes while they were indenting with the tip of an AFM in the central part of the suspended beam. In, in this way, they were monitoring the changes of this resistance up on the formation. Okay, so it was a strain tunable resistor. Okay, it's not so functional, but it's the first functionality you can, you can achieve with this strain tunable. The problem of this geometry is that you have to have an, an AFM tip on top of the, of the suspended beam all the time and you need a uh, working AFM in order to operate the device, which makes uh, everything a little bit cumbersome, especially if you're interested in optoelectronics. So it's difficult to implement this kind of geometry in an optoelectronic device because you have the tip of the AFM, so if you want to illuminate the device with light, the tip of the AFM is going to make a shade on the, on the device. Other, other approaches is, uh, have been reported in Sonnenberger's group, uh, for instance, using a mechanically controllable brake junction, in a, in a fully encapsulated graphene device. And in this case here, they were focused on measure el uh, electric field characteristics of graphene up on strain. Okay, but they were not uh, interacting with light or, or anything and just using graphene, not the semiconducting material. And also in, in Stanford's group, they are also trying to integrate graphene in, in, a, in a MEMS device, in a silicon MEMS device. Uh, microelectronic mechanical mechanical system device, in where they're using this uh, this thermal expansion uh, mechanism in order to stretch the graphene, but so far they've been they've been measured uh, just uh, Raman Raman measurements on this freely suspended graphene up on strains, so still not uh, uh, electrical measurement on, on these kind of devices. So when we review this. Uh, this uh, state of the art, the state of the technique in, in strain-tronic devices, we were thinking about, we were wondering what could we add to this field of research. And in my group, we are rather good on finding easy uh, solutions to relatively complicated technical problems. And we were thinking that uh, maybe we can find an easy way to, to have a, a good geometry for integration in, in a device, okay, and allowing to change the strain dynamically, okay. So the oh, sorry, our our solution was to fabricate our devices on polymers that have a large thermal expansion. In this way, by changing the temperature of the substrate just a few degrees, we can apply a biaxial strain to the device. Okay, so in this uh, animation here, what you have is a sequence of optical images of a polymer in where we have made these little holes here in order to allow you to see the expansion, okay? So by changing from 32 to 110 degrees, you see a quite substantial expansion of the, of the polymer. So you can imagine that if you transfer now a two-dimensional material on the surface of this material, if you change the temperature, so this polymer will stretch 
this two-dimensional material. By using the right substrates, we can really uh, span a large uh, range of, of uh, by axial strains from minus 1.5% to 0.5% uh, of by axial deformations. So we wanted to, to exploit this thermal expansion of polymers in order to fabricate our strain tunable devices. And the way we do it is we start with a substrate, polycarbonate, that has a large thermal expansion and has a large yoke modulus. This is important because you need a good trade-off between thermal expansion and yoke modulus. A substrate with low yoke modulus will have problems in transferring the strain from the substrate to the two-dimensional material on top. So we fabricate uh, electrodes on this polycarbonate by shadow mask evaporation, and then we transfer uh, molybdenum disulfide single layer bridging the two electrodes. And we do this by using deterministic placement methods, so basically stamping. Okay, so we stamp a two-dimensional material bridging these two electrodes using a deterministic placement uh, tool that we, we have developed in, in my group. Okay, this is an example of an indium selenide flake bridging two gold electrodes that have been pre-patterned on silicon oxide. We do the same on polycarbonate in order to transfer a molybdenum disulfide single layer between two electrodes. And then the measurement that we do is we simply monitor the changes in the current flowing through the device. So we apply a bias between the two electrodes. We measure current and we start illuminating the device with different wavelengths. Okay, and in order then what we get is basically the output characteristic, the output the spectral characteristics of our device. is the spectral responsivity of our device. So different points here are different wavelengths we are limiting with, and we get the responsivity that is proportional to this photocurrent. And we have different spectra here. It corresponds to different levels of strain from plus 0.48%, uh, so tension, to minus 0.8%. Compression. So basically, by changing the temperature of this polycarbonate, we can get all the way from plus 0.5 percent, and if we cool it down to liquid nitrogen, we can reach minus 1.5 percent deformation. So a lot of compression here. And the first thing that we realize is that this spectra here has two peaks. These two peaks correspond to direct pan gap transitions in the K-point of the Brill that is in the in the literature they're labeled as A and B excitons. Is the this A peak here is this direct pan transition from the topmost balance band to the bottom of the conduction band. And then balance band in molybdenum disulfide is split it. Therefore you have this second peak that is called the B exciton, this one here. And these two peaks they shift towards lower energy if you increase the biaxial strain. So if you, ten, if you apply tension to the material, you can reduce this band gap energy, okay? So you, you modulate the band gap of your semiconducting material by applying strain. And this is what we see here in this, in this plot here. But also, if you're thinking about a photodetector, it's also interesting to take a look to this tail here, okay? This tail here tells you the maximum wavelength you can detect in your photodetector device is what is called the cutoff wavelength. And then we can monitor the changes in this cutoff wavelength. We can also monitor the changes in this A peak as a function of the strain or the temperature of the substrate. And what we see is that we have a huge, a huge uh, shift up to 260 milli electron volts in the cutoff wavelength. So we can really, by changing the amount of the strain, we can really modify the spectral bandwidth of our photodetector. As a, as a secondary effect, well, now, so I have to, to comment that we have now more sensitive devices using different materials. So there are other two-dimensional materials that they are even more sensitive to strain than molydisulfide. Um, another secondary effect is that by changing the amount of a strain, so if we go from compressive to, to tension, we can also change the amount of responsivity. So how responsive is the device to, to light? By applying tension, our device becomes very, resist, very responsive. So it can, it can generate a lot of photocurrent per photon. While applying compression to the device, the device becomes less sensitive, 
but I have to, to add that they become much faster as well. And at this point, you might be wondering what is the effect of the temperature and what is the effect of the biaxial strain? Because in order to apply these mechanical deformations, we have to change the temperature of the substrate. In order to disentangle these two effects, what we do is we fabricate two different sets of devices. One device is on polycarbonate that has thermal expansion and has a temperature change. And we fabricate another set of devices on silicon oxide that has a negligible thermal expansion. And we subject these two, two set of devices to the same thermal cycling from 25 degrees to 100 degrees. And what we see is that on the polycarbonate substrates, we see a seizable change in the energy of the A peak, okay? And we also see an enhancement of the photocurrent. While in, this, in the device on silicon oxide, there is a negligible change in the in the in the photocurrent in the responsivity and there is a very small change in the position of the of the exciton so most of the features that we observe in our in our experiments they are indeed related to biaxial strain and not to the temperature change and moreover so we can using our our heater our th temperature states we can change the level of a strain in time so in this example here i saw how we can modulate the strain from 0.48 0 0.16, 0 0.48, 0.16, 0 0.48, 0 0.16, 0 0.48, 0 0.16. So we can we can change this strain on time as using molybdenum disulfide strain trunk devices. Uh, this is strain as a tuning knob indeed. Um, we can extract the, the the time the time response of our devices from these kind of plots here, and we get. Uh, time response is on the order of 20 seconds. In this case here, we are actually limited by the, by the, the, the thermal properties of our temperature states. So it's not something intrinsic of our strain trunk device, but it's the, the, temp, the time it takes for the, for the thermal stages to, to thermalize. 20 seconds sounds too much, but if we compare with the other adaptable photodetector device we want to copy in the human eye, it's actually quite fast our device. So it's 20 seconds. If we are in a, in, a, in a room with a lot of light and we enter into a dark room, human eye takes like around 10 minutes to accommodate. Okay? And full accommodation takes 30 minutes. Our device, on the other hand, is it takes 20 seconds to, to, to accommodate. Uh, and nowadays we even have faster devices using microheater arrays. In, in order, instead of using a macroheater, that is rather slow, as you can see here. So you have these micro heaters, they're, they're really slow. Our micro heaters, they react much faster now, okay? And we are, we are working now on integrating this micro heater technology in our Strengthronic platform. So then the take home message here is that we can, using these Strengthronic devices, we can go all the way from, from fast, uh, low responsivity and narrow band gap semiconducting photodetector materials applying compression. If we apply tension to our photodetectors, we get high responsivity, we get a wide band gap, a wide spectral bandwidth, uh, but the devices, they become slow. And this, this reminds quite well to what happens to human eye in during the daylight. So it would be the compression, the co applying compression, our photodetector behaves as the human eye during the daylight. And applying tension to the device it behaves as the human eye during the night vision. And interestingly, we can tune all the way from one state to the other one by applying different levels of strain. So it's, it's fully tunable, fully reversible. Um, I have to finish now acknowledging the, the people in the group. Uh, some, some people involved in this research, like, like Ryu and Patricia Gant, they, they already left. Uh, the rest of the, of the group is still uh, working on, on this research field. Um, especially thank you. I have to thank you, especially Ricardo Frisenda that has been really involved in, in this uh, research offline and, and also the funding sources and thanking you for your attention. Thank you.